This is section 78 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Russian Sufferers by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. On December 18, 1905, an entertainment was given at the casino for the benefit of the Russian sufferers. After the performance, Mr. Clemens spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems a sort of cruelty to inflict upon an audience like this our rude English tongue after we have heard that divine speech flowing in that lucid Gaelic tongue. It has always been a marvel to me, that French language. It has always been a puzzle to me. How beautiful that language is, how expressive it seems to be, how full of grace it is and when it comes from lips like those how eloquent and how liquid it is and oh i am always deceived i always think i am going to understand it oh it is such a delight to me such a delight to me to meet madame bernhardt and laugh hand to hand and heart to heart with her i have seen her play as we all have, and oh, that is divine. But I have always wanted to know Madame Bernhardt herself, her fiery self. I have wanted to know that beautiful character. Why, she is the youngest person I ever saw, except myself, for I always feel young when I come in the presence of young people." I have a pleasant recollection of an incident so many years ago when Madame Bernhardt came to Hartford, where I lived, and she was going to play, and the tickets were three dollars, and there were two lovely women, a widow and her daughter, neighbors of ours, highly cultivated ladies they were. Their tastes were fine and elevated, but they were very poor, and they said, well, we must not spend six dollars on a pleasure of the mind, a pleasure of the intellect. We must spend it, if it must go at all, to furnish to somebody bread to eat. And so they sorrowed over the fact that they had to give up that great pleasure of seeing Madame Bernhardt, but there were two neighbors equally highly cultivated, and who could not afford bread, and those good-hearted Joneses sent that six dollars, deprived themselves of it, and sent it to those poor Smiths to buy bread with, and those Smiths took it, and bought tickets with it to see Madame Bernhardt. Oh, yes, some people have tastes and intelligence also. Now, I was going to make a speech. I supposed I was, but I am not. It is late, late, and so I am going to tell a story. And there is this advantage about a story, anyway, that whatever moral or valuable thing you put into a speech, why, it gets diffused among those involuted sentences, and possibly your audience goes away without finding out what that valuable thing was that you were trying to confer upon it. But, dear me, you put the same jewel into a story, and it becomes the keystone of that story, and you are bound to get it. It flashes, it flames. It is the jewel in the toad's head. You don't overlook that. Now, if I am going to talk on such a subject as, for instance, the lost opportunity, oh, the lost opportunity, Anybody in this house who has reached the turn of life, sixty or seventy, or even fifty, or along there, when he goes back along his history, there he finds it milestoned all the way with a lost opportunity, and you know how pathetic that is. You younger ones cannot know the full pathos that lies in those words, the lost opportunity. But anybody who is old, who has really lived and felt this life, he knows the pathos of the lost opportunity. Now I will tell you a story whose moral is that, 
whose lesson is that whose lament is that i was in a village which is a suburb of new bedford several years ago well new bedford is a suburb of fair haven or perhaps it is the other way in any case it took both of those towns to make a great center of the great whaling industry of the first half of the nineteenth century and i was up there at fair haven some years ago with a friend of mine there was a dedication of a great town hall a public building and we were there in the afternoon this great building was filled like this great theatre with rejoicing villagers and my friend and i started down the center aisle he saw a man standing in that aisle and he said now look at that bronzed veteran at that mahogany-faced man now tell me do you see anything about that man's face that is emotional do you see anything about it that suggests that inside that man anywhere there are fires that can be started would you ever imagine that that is a human volcano why no i said i would not he looks like a wooden indian in front of a cigar store very well said my friend i will show you that there is emotion even in that unpromising place i will just go to that man and i will just mention in the most casual way an incident in his life that man is getting along toward ninety years old he is past eighty i will mention an incident of fifty or sixty years ago now just watch the effect and it will be so casual that if you don't watch you won't know when i do say that thing but you just watch the effect he went on down there and accosted this antiquity and made a remark or two i could not catch up they were so casual i could not recognize which one it was that touched that bottom for in an instant that old man was literally in eruption and was filling the whole place with profanity of the most exquisite kind you never heard such accomplished profanity i never heard it also delivered with such eloquence i never enjoyed profanity as i enjoyed it then more than if i had been uttering it myself there is nothing like listening to an artist all his passions passing away in lava smoke thunder lightning and earthquake then this friend said to me now i will tell you about that about sixty years ago that man was a young fellow of twenty-three and had just come home from a three years whaling voyage he came into that village of his happy and proud because now instead of being chief mate he was going to be master of a whale ship and he was proud and happy about it then he found that there had been a kind of a cold frost come upon that town and the whole region round about for while he had been away the father mayhew temperance excitement had come upon the whole region therefore everybody had taken the pledge there wasn't anybody for miles and miles around that had not taken the pledge so you can see what a solitude it was to this young man who was fond of his grog and he was just an outcast because when they found he would not join father mayhew's society they ostracized him and he went about that town three weeks day and night in utter loneliness the only human being in the whole place who ever took grog and he had to take it privately if you don't know what it is to be ostracized to be shunned by your fellow man may you never know it then he recognized that there was something more valuable in this life than grog and that is the fellowship of your fellow man and at last he gave it up and at nine o'clock one night he went down to the father matthew temperance society and with a broken heart he said put my name down for membership in this society and then he went away crying and at earliest dawn the next morning they came for him and routed him out 
and they said that new ship of his was ready to sail on a three years voyage in a minute he was on board that ship and gone and he said well he was not out of sight of that town till he began to repent but he had made up his mind that he would not take a drink and so that whole voyage of three years was a three years agony to that man because he saw all the time the mistake he had made he felt it all through he had constant reminders of it because the crew would pass him with their grog come out on the deck and take it and there was the torturous smell of it he went through the whole three years of suffering and at last coming into port it was snowy it was cold he was stamping through the snow two feet deep on the deck and longing to get home and there was his crew torturing him to the last minute with hot grog but at last he had his reward he really did get to shore at last and jumped and ran and bought a jug and rushed to the society's office and said to the secretary take my name off your membership books and do it right away i have got a three years thirst on and the secretary said it is not necessary you were blackballed end of russian sufferers by mark twain read by john greenman